Welcome back to AB Conspiracy, your news at 10. We have just received word that the senator from Georgia has left hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands, of children behind in homes and farms across the good state. History is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Yeah, so let's let's look at college. Then we're going to talk a lot about the testing for college and the military because they are hand in hand and there is a dark genesis for both of them. So there's this thing called the College Entrance Examination Board. Um, they picture them as like the same demographic of people in the committee attend. Like they kick it. They kind of know about each other. And this board offered their first exams in 1901. This was entirely for the elite. Uh, it was meant to standardize admission requirements for uh, posh boarding schools and for the Ivy Leagues. All well and good. People dug it. Fast forward. World War I hits. The military institutes a number of aptitude and placement tests, specifically the alpha and the beta test. The idea here is that they will match new recruits to specific appropriate roles in the military based on their perceived intelligence. And I hope you hear the italics when I say perceived, because that comes back in a big, big way. And of course, you know, whenever you hear about standardized tests, you think of the IQ test, the Stanford Binet intelligence test that comes around in 1916. It's been controversial ever since because parts of it are broken. Uh, there's the what was originally called the Scholar Aptitude Test or SAT. And don't just know that saying SAT test is like saying ATM machine or VIN number. You could just call it <laughs> SAT, right? Uh, that's 1926. It's invented by a guy. <clears throat> who is a main character of our story, but by no means a protagonist. He's actually a tragic figure. His name is Carl Campbell Brigham. When he invents the SAT in 1926, he's doing it based on those army tests because he created those. And we'll, Carl's going to come back. Keep your mind on Carl and, and don't make friends with him. Uh, <laughs> then there's this guy, Everett Lindquist. He created the ACT, uh, American College Testing, in 1959. Wait, Lindquist? That doesn't sound like an American last name. That sounds kind of Swedish or Scandinavian. We're American, baby. Our names don't mean shit. That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. Shout out to everybody who got that pained Pulp Fiction reference. All right. So now we're in the 1970s. Individual states. That's what the U.S. is all about. And they kind of have their own fiefdoms when it comes to education. So... If you are a kid in Massachusetts, you're getting a different education from a kid in Hawaii or a kid in Texas or a kid in, you know, Washington or something. The education system is decentralized. This means that states control their own systems and, frankly, some do a better job than others. So this national testing regime that comes out is a way for the federal government to get like a bigger high level view of American over education overall. And then very soon, like increasingly as the years went on, funding for schools got tied to test performance, which meant that things like the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001 would say, hey, if, you're, if your student body isn't doing well on these specific tests, then your funding will be in trouble. Uh, if you have any teachers in your family, you know this was tremendously unpopular. Teach the test. Teach the yeah. test. Well, and a lot of that goes back to a, a report that came out titled A Nation at Risk, the Imperative for Educational Reform, which occurred in 1983, just after the 70s, as you said, Ben, after the push uh, for a need to see how the nation is doing, especially when compared to other countries. Mm -hmm. And this uh, report, A Nation at Risk, basically stated, hey, the U.S. is falling way, way behind on its standards for what each individual kid knows. Yeah, an education gap, which is something that uh, honestly is, is a calculated framework, because you can take people who might ideologically say uh, we don't want to fund more stuff unless it's a defense initiative. But then if you freeze education as a matter of national defense, which it very much is, then 
you are you have a higher chance of getting those people on board. I wrote a, an essay many years ago uh, that was entirely phrasing uh, public health care as an issue of national defense. And I 100 percent believe it is. Well, and also like, you know, a buzz phrase or like a program title, like No Child Left Behind gives this sense of this egalitarian kind of like equality for all children, education. But the reality is just because the program exists doesn't make those individualized kind of legacy school systems uh, with their various resources, depending on where they're located and then who is going to the schools and what kind of money is flowing in and out of them, whether they're private, whether they're public, it doesn't make them fundamentally change. Uh, do I hear do I hear the senator from Georgia? Right. Is he against no child left behind? Oh, uh, really? You are <laughs> against no child left behind, eh? So you don't like children? Is that what you're saying? You don't want children to succeed, sir, the gentleman? Well, welcome back to AB Conspiracy, your news at 10. We have just received word that the senator from Georgia has left hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands, of children behind in homes and farms across the good state. Who will find them? How will they ever be found again? <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. end scene. End <laughs> scene. Um, at this point, you might be thinking, okay, this makes sense. I understand the the point, standards, testing, et cetera. But why are you guys talking about it on stuff they don't want you to know? A show that applies critical thinking to troubling subjects. Well, it's because standardized testing is a massively troubled subject. Uh, first, just to put it plainly, the dumbest thing, and I say this, truly in a truly affectionate manner is that right now for the entirety of human history, no one, not once, not never has been able to make a real fair and effective definition of intelligence that everybody you, accepts as evidenced by how many different tests there are and how many different flavors of tests and how much debate there is around what they're actually measuring and which one is the quote unquote best because there right. isn't one. Otherwise there'd be like one, but right. there's a ton. And capitalism plays a role in that too. Just spoiler, but there's, there's uh, it, you know, it, it is interesting. There are people who've done brilliant people who've done uh, brilliant work on this, at least in my dumb opinion. And you'll see competing models like is intelligence multidimensional, meaning should we say that um, quantitative intelligence is different from interpersonal intelligence or kinetic intelligence? And then you'll have people who say, well, functionally, intelligence should just be defined as the ability to uh, to operate well in given circumstances or environments. That means that someone like Albert Einstein would be very unintelligent in the Paleolithic era because he doesn't know how to do the things that are important to being alive at that time. So there's a lot of... And he's just speaking you know, gibberish. Nobody understands him. He's just, he's a gibberator the whole time. You know, they sacrifice him to like whatever uh, nature thing they're worshiping at the time. It, they would have just shaved know. his mustache and head hair for like, you know, warmth. You know, mm. to make like a tiny sweater out of it or burn in a pyre of some sort. Well, they would have been, I think. Well, OK, first, there would have been disease spread. And then secondly, uh, they probably would have preserved his clothing as well as they could. Anyway, anyway. Yeah. Just so many, thought, so many, uh, just so many thought, things to unpack uh, <laughs> about Albert Einstein just, just turning up in Paleolithic era. So many questions. He's a wild womanizer, <laughs> okay. though. I think he would have. I, I don't think it would oh, have wasted dear. some time, um, too much time before he started chatting up the locals. The reason we're making a big deal about the attempts to define intelligence are because at a very basic level, you can't really test for something if you don't understand it. <laughs> 